There was only one football match of note this weekend. That was Armagh and their refix game against Fermanagh. 3.14 to 10 points to Armagh in, uh, in Brewster Park in Fermanagh. A man who was at the game, and I, I don't know if he was thankful to be there, is Declan Bogue. Declan, what was it like? Uh, very one-sided. Um, Shane, hey, you know, we were sitting in the press box beforehand and there was just the usual thing of talking about, you know, you automatically get a match day program. You always say, "Well, that's not the team that'll play," and you say it now almost out of cliche. But then the news was coming through uh, that Owen Donnelly wouldn't be about, that Conal Jones wouldn't be about. I'm just looking at the program here. Shea uh, Conan was out as well, wasn't he? Shea Conan. Yeah, McCusker wouldn't be playing, and you're just thinking, uh, you know, Owen Donnelly, an all-star nominee, Dak McCusker's been a real mainstay of that defence and say. Uh, since Pete McGrath came in, Conal Jones is the main free taker. And then just before the game threw in, this is one very, very late uh, inclusion with Shea Cullen, 2018 All-Star fallback nominee for an All-Star. Missed out because he got a bang in his leg during the warm-up. Um, so you're kind of looking at that and feeling very worried because there's a real leadership among the four players that we're, we've talked about. Like, that's almost a third-year team. And there's a million different mitigating factors. Ray, Ray McMillan was very strong in saying afterwards that, you know, maybe he was wrong because he was asking James Allen, who's... James Allen's a young enough promising fullback, but he was basically put in from the start to try and mark Stefan Campbell. And he was only told five minutes before the game, you're going in and you're starting. He, he has played, I don't know or don't believe that he's played any league football. I think it's just been limited to McKenna Cup games. Then you're looking at Aidan Breen, who uh, Aidan Breen hasn't played fullback for Fermanagh ever. And he had to go in and, and, and mark Rain O'Neill. One of the hottest properties, you know, Aidan Brings from Tampa, I would know him well, and he won a, a county championship and league title as a fullback. But that was back in 2012, and he never really, he's, a, he's more a midfielder, and he plays like as an up and down role for Fermanagh. So, I mean, you just told completely right, all that's changing, you're going in and marking one of the hottest properties in the game. And he actually did okay, he did, he did, he did good, like you're just not going to contain someone like Ray O'Neill all game. But they're just so unsettled from the from the word go and Armagh had a good old breeze at the back so from James McGrath's pe- uh, kickouts they pushed seven into the Fermanagh 45 so seven players up and that made James McGrath have to go long and then you've got Neil Grimley Oshino Neil Jarlitho Burns Main Mountain brilliant athletes Fermanagh had a patched up sort of midfield Ryan Jones had to go a bit deeper uh, he's been playing in the half forward line. He had to go deeper and all the rest. Richard Callum was there, um, but it was it was a bit messy. Armagh won six of the Fermanagh kickouts in the opening half, and they had what one eight to three points by half time racked up. So it was already <clears throat> it was already over. There wasn't going to be a great comeback because the inspirational players weren't free or weren't available to play, and it just went from there. Like it just could have got really ugly because Armagh passed up a few goal chances where one more pass would have done or one less pass might have done either. Uh, hit the crossbar. Uh, yeah, just a real good evening for Armagh and a real poor evening for Fermanagh, I suppose. Yeah, because Fermanagh are now looking down the barrel of, the gun, of going down to Division 3, which of course means Tier 2 football. Mm-hmm. Armagh, of course, at the flip side, they're at the top of Division 2 and looking fairly rosy at the moment. But we can just focus on Fermanagh for a second. The, um, Ricey was talking afterwards about the lack of facilities and that they were even relying on goodwill from clubs in Tyrone for facilities. Can you give uh, put a bit of shape to that? Well, I mean, goodwill would be coming from his own club as Dremore, uh, and they've been training in Clogher as well. That's two Tyrone clubs. So obviously, Clogher, the link there might be uh, Statsman, Ed McElroy in the backroom team. He's from Clogher. Uh, Joe McMahon, his selector, was coach of Clogher last year, so they have plenty of contacts in Clogher. Um, and then they've been using the Bonacre, which is a leisure a council facility in Irvinstown. So essentially, they haven't trained in grass for the last three weeks. They've been just training on 3G surfaces or 4G, whatever you want to call them, in Dromore and, and, uh, and the Bonacre. So it's um, they might be victims of circumstance in some ways in that I'd say for the last 60 days it mightn't have rained twice 
two days and all that. It's just extremely wet. Uh, there's just a lack among the clubs of giving over facilities. Sometimes you have to understand that you know they're in the middle of their preseason too. They're using their pitches that so are caught up. Um, you know they have to look after their own end. Uh, but I suppose the elephant in the room about all this is that Fermanagh did create uh, listen, and that's going back a long time. Like you know, it's going back bef- long before Girvahi. Uh, I forget. When exactly, but it was about 2000 that they started work on Listen as their own centre of action, so you want to call it that. It's up on the top of a hill. Uh, the pitches have never been good. They've never, ever been good and something that teams relish getting up there. In the middle of summer, they'll do. They'll suffice. But in the middle of winter, they're they're continually boggy. And, you know, just even at the moment now, if you go three quarters away up one of the, one end of the pitch, your foot will be down to the ankle and bog. They never sorted it out. I just can't really understand it. Maybe I need to ask more questions, but how a facility that's going 20 years almost and it's just never fit for purpose. I remember actually sitting down with John O'Neill in 2010. He had just taken over the job from Malachi O'Rourke and he told me at the time that they were going to take the training around the county just to spread out and get more of a feel and try and get the county behind the team a bit more. Uh, and at the time, that that comment then in, in Gaelic Life was brought up at a county board meeting and people were pretty um, upset about this, that there's nothing wrong with listen. But that's 10 years ago. Um, and after John O'Neill went, Peter Calvin came in and, you know, they had use of certain grounds around the county Pete McGraw would have done the same. Uh, if there's a, this might be an exaggeration. It might there might be any truth in it, but there's probably no hugely visible presence on the line there from Fermanagh as a Fermanagh person. And I think that might, if you had someone from one of the clubs, and the clubs might be more willing to give over their pitches. That might be entirely unfair. It might be totally wrong and unfair. I don't know, but. Uh, you just can't do it. What what is the point of playing a league game on a Saturday night in Brewster Park uh, on a soft field when you've been playing on 4G and the ball bouncing about like a ping pong uh, table? Added to that, as a, maybe a small thing, but to me it's a huge thing when you're preparing a team, is the warm-up was done on Saturday night in, in almost total darkness. The lights didn't go on until 10 to 7, with the game thrown in at 7. Fermanagh and Armagh did their warm-up in complete darkness. I just find that credible. Because just before we came on to chat, I was <clears throat> between the context of how they were prepared for these games with the train facilities and even what Ricey said afterwards in terms of players probably possibly heading away for the summer and he goes um, about the tier two that the GA has gone to corporate. I can see a manager of a small county that Crow Park don't give an F-U-C-K about us at the bottom. Maybe you're not meant to say that, but that's my feeling on it. And tier yeah. two is basically for big teams. So th- what, I'm, what I kind of suggest to you is that almost Fermanagh are living in a world where Dublin are up at the, the top of the developed world and they're almost operating like a third world county. And uh, I, I noticed it didn't exactly, it rubbed you up possibly a little bit the wrong way as a Fermanagh man. But there's kind of an element to that, that they're just operating in a different realm. I I just go back to, um, but it's not just for mana. I mean, it, it, that's uh, that's also, in, 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 you can say that Roscommon are probably a greater county than for mana. In terms of numbers, they are far greater um, facilities that should be better too and all that. And just, you know, uh, it would be recognised and playing at a higher level, even though for mana, uh, the paradox is that they, they quite often get the better of Roscommon in Championship and League. Uh, I just brought back to the Kevin McStay story in his, in his autobiography, his brilliant read, and he mentions that himself and Fergie O'Donnell used to always lock up the, was it, maybe it was Hyde Park and maybe it wasn't, but they used to, they were responsible at the end of the night after training for locking up the, the facilities and they used to be wrestling with these huge, uh, heavy chains and freezing cold water or freezing cold weather. And Fergie used to make a quip that I can't see. I wonder is Jim Gavin locking all the gates up in Parnell Park tonight? And the two of them used to get a great laugh out of that. And then it became a thing where he'd only have to start saying it before the two of them would be increased in laughter. Uh, but it is, 
uh, you've got caretakers for places like Gervahi, uh, Derry have magnificent um, facility in Owen Beg, and Dublin have the use. And people can say, oh, Dublin don't have a centre of excellence. Dublin don't need one. Dublin has the best facilities in the country on their doorsteps, and they've got the place in Abbottstown, and they've got wherever else they're using, DCU and St. Clair's and all that. Uh, so they don't need to. They come in and they would be treated like royalty and they don't have to worry about all the other wee bits and pieces that people are doing. And that, when I say for man are doing that, you can be damn sure that, you know, Antrim have a centre of excellence there and Dunsilly, I don't know how operational it is. But the further you go down, the tougher and tougher it would be to find a place to actually train. And that seems remarkable in this age that we're talking about 30 million euros to prepare inter-county teams over the course of 2019. It's absolutely crazy that uh, an awful lot of these counties are living hand to mouth and having to change venues or training. And the WhatsApp uh, group is going buzzing mental, saying it's on here, it's on here, it's on here. Uh, it's just beggar's belief, doesn't it? Do you worry about the future for Fermanagh in, in terms of like the gap between the top, middle, bottom of, of the GA ladder in another 15 years' time? Uh, you, you know, I don't know because 15 years ago was a year after Fermanagh reached an all Ireland semi-final. Uh, and, you, you know, people are always saying there'll be a bubble that'll burst there. Um, the thing that'll always come against Fermanagh will be the amount of clubs and the amount of players. Uh, it's a strange-ish county in that because there's only 20 clubs, um, when you think about that and you, you, you think about, say, the, your, your people who are in your first 13 that you hand into the county board, how many of those players actually coming up through have played for their county in development squads, minors and under-21s or under-20s as it is now? Uh, and for Mana, it's, it's remarkable because you can go through nearly every club and you can see that there's almost about seven or eight in each you know, senior football team that have played county for Fermanagh. So there's a real loyalty. Uh, they have got so much right. I mean, the fundraising group, Club Ernia, raised the biggest percentage of money to uh, fundraising to commercial of any county in Ireland uh, last year. Um, and there's very talented and enthusiastic and hardworking people there. Um, and they know because my nephew's in the Fermanagh minor team, like there's an unbelievable amount of work going on there. Morris McLaughlin is the manager, Mark McHugh is in as a selector. They're getting good people, uh, they're getting enthusiastic, you know people involved and the, the the schools thing has always been propped up by St. Michael's and they won a home cup last year and all their players were from Fermanagh they had no sort of lads from Trillick or Dremore in it this, t- this time so it'll be, it'd be very hard to predict where they're going to be in 15 years time but I'd be overly optimistic because Club Ernia keep bringing in and they signed over 225,000 this year and their target this year is to hand over the county board a quarter of a million pound. A quarter of a million pound for a county like Fermanagh is just, it, it just blows my mind like how they're able to do this. The, but with Club Ernia, they're completely apolitical. What I mean by that is, and I was involved in a very small way of helping Club Ernia get off the ground when it was started, um, along with some others, and it was said at the very first meetings that they, they would not seek to curry favour or influence any decisions on team management, on policy, on anything. This money was to be raised. It was to be handed over to the county board and they were to invest it through youth. They've employed uh, S&C people. They've employed youth coaches and all that. They've done this all off their own back because they went to Croke Park and asked for funding for uh, one coach, one full-time S&C coach, and they did that off the recommendation of a Wexford man who compiled a report into Fermanagh. And he said, go to Croke Park, get them to fund a full-time S&C man that would look after all the teams, all the development teams. And Croke Park said no. So County Board said, right, what do we do? And Club Ernie says, sure, we'll fund it. And they funded too. And that has been going very well. Uh, I just think that some of that money now maybe has to be looked at and used at the lesson complex. I mean, I don't know. I'm not 
I wouldn't know much about turf and how you could, uh, you know, regenerate that place up there, but it needs a lot of work. But the money's there. There's clearly a lot of money there, like flo floating about. In look, when I say a lot of money, they'll be running a surplus, and the club earning your money is almost virtually guaranteed. So why not invest some of that? Yeah, fair point. Um, can we move on to Arma uh, because they're top of Division Two, like we said. Um, I think this is is it the sixth year of Kieran McGinney's reign. How are they going? Like, uh, would you have seen them a few times this year? In fairness to Arma too, and this is another thing. Like you know, you can't pity for Mana the whole time either because Armagh, um, Armagh have plans now to do their own centre of excellence. The plans are gorgeous looking. At it. It's, it, thankfully, it's one of these centre of excellence that praises function over form. By, what I mean by that is Gervahi is in the, the shape of a Celtic tea. And I, I, don't I was know that. that. It's absolutely <laughs> insane because you have these, like it's that old Celtic tea with the little yeah, darting yeah. corners. So you have rooms with like corners that are dark and jutting like that and it's just so pointless. Well, they didn't build a gym. They didn't have a gym in it. They, they had a, a small room with some treadmills and whatnot, but they they had a, built a centre of action. They built a, a child's play park, which is not far from me here. And I used to bring the young fellow up that he loved it because it's a big sleigh and all. But then they had to, after spending the money on the Child's Play Park, they've levelled it and they're now building a purpose built gym, which is to the side of the team. So, but anyway, I'm getting off the point. The point being, Armagh went round the houses and have trained all over the place. And Callan Bridge used to be, a, a, I don't know if it was now, but there was only containers and a, a, you know, it was fairly Spartan for them. And they have made it work, you know. So, in fairness to Kieran McGinley, uh, you never heard them talk about facilities or anything like that. They just kind of got on with it. Uh, and it's a funny one because McGinney, you know, he got some really, really bad hockey ins at the start in the Ulster Championship in the first few years. Uh, one in particular against Donegal in 2015, like they just got wiped off the field completely. Um, and his thing was always we're building for the future and we're building a team that will play a certain way. Like, you know, they are not and they haven't been a defensive team. But they played for Mana and Cross McGlynn last year in a game that they must win, you know, uh, uh, in round six because they were, the tables were turned. Like, for Mana had it in their own gift to go up and Armagh were trying to avoid relegation. They beat for Mana that day by doing a, everyone back 15 men behind the ball, but they just did it so much better than for Mana. So, you know, there's a little bit of versatility. Haven't seen them do it too much, but they're certainly uh, when they're on song like that and they're all out attack like they they are really good. Like you know, they've some lovely players. Um, and from the moment that the ball was put in from the, the third minute and Jamie Clark got his goal, you just, there was a nerve inevitability that this was going to be a stuffing. You know, uh, just just to even run through their forward line and some of the options they have. First of all, I think they all look like. <clears throat> top level athletic players that you know, yeah, they're, they're all like, I mean, that's, that's, that's the other thing about continuity. continuity. People come in and they do a job for two years, three years, and then they're gone. Uh, and uh, probably McGinney being there is a uh, Julie Davies, Julie Davis, whose brother now is with the throne team, like, um, and their other sister is with Ulster Rugby. Like, so this SNC expertise runs in the family, clearly. But they have been building and building and building. And Fermanagh put in different players. Obviously, they were stretched already. But you know, some of the younger players that were playing and some of the subs that came on, you could just see. You only have to look like you know the difference in S and C, the shape of players, the physique, and all was just marked. It was a marked difference. But you had, let me just go through it. Rory Grugan, Stephen Campbell, and Mark Shields, who's a brilliant player. Um, you know, Mark Shields brilliant running up and down the field, but they brought in Aidan Nugent, who scored a goal in two, and he was a big player for them at wing forward last year in the championship. So he was obviously in the forward line too. Uh, Ryan Kennedy was he was a late inclusion. Ray O'Neill, Jimmy Clark, Connor Turbot, young fella, uh, had a brilliant opening day in the league. Did he get a hat trick of goals? I think he might have. But then also, like they were able to bring in Ethan Rafferty off the bench, 
um, James Morgan off the bench, Arne McKay, Greg McCabe. Like, you know, these these are now seasoned players. I remember Jim McCarry saying after that game across last year that we need another year in Division 2. At the time, I kind of wrote it off and said, well, you, you know, it's one of those ones, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? But I can see, I can totally see what he's saying now because they have developed in that league. And they, <clears throat> and should they get up to Division 1, if they beat Roscommon, they're pretty much certain then that they're in a much better position to try and survive up there. Because we all know how difficult that is for newly promoted teams. Because like, you've, you've gone through it there. There is a lot of class in that forward line. Is there any reason that they can't push themselves up into... I mean, obviously we've seen Mead get promoted and get pasted by everyone. Kildare obviously lost all seven of their games there when they were up in Division 1. Is there any reason that they can't go up and survive? Because just looking at raw quality and they have a manager who's been there for many years... I mean, there's question marks over whether he's a top-level manager or a middle-range type of manager. but And and that's partly straight, you know, down to the record, you know, the amount of wins well, on the year. Well, you know, you know, I mean, the manager can only really be judged on championship. You and know, Mourinho went five years without winning an Ulster five, championship five game. Years, that's, just, like, that's just fact. And they beat down in extra time in Uri last year. That was it. That was the record. They beat down after extra time, and they were they did they get a fortunate goal where the forty five kind of sailed through someone's hands, or was that the other way around? That might have been the other way around. But, but another thing I'd say is like I thought in twenty fourteen when Paul Grimley was over the team and Kieran McGinney was selector, and they went got to Croke Park and they they had a, an unbelievable match against Donegal, which they just about lost. It was like a point or something like that. I thought this Dun this Armagh team. We're playing yeah, really yeah. exciting stuff. They can't be too far away. And here we are in 2020 now, still waiting for them to hit the next level. Yeah, they went back a bit. And, uh, you know, changing factors, Grimley stepping down, Kieran coming in, perhaps imposing a new style of play, all those reasons. Like, I mean, you know, you, you can't, it can't always be jammed tomorrow. Like, you know, that. so this next number of weeks and then this summer, really will tell us where they're kind of at. But uh, I think it was a two-year agreement that McGinney came to with the Armagh County Board uh, in terms of staying on. And he was lucky to get it. Like, you know, um, there, there can be no doubt about that. People will look at five years, no championship wins, and say, well, what an under, like, one championship win. like, And they will wonder what, what what the point of it all is of this pursuit? Uh, so he was lucky enough to get it, but um, but you know you you have to wonder like if things don't go well for them in the championship, and then they have an like say I'm just talking in terms of say they beat Roscommon on Saturday they get up to Division One, and the positivity would just be bubbling in that camp. Then they played Derry in the Ulster Championship, and I just don't know about that game because. Rory Gallagher's over Derry and expectations outside the county are just so low, but they have an opportunity to go away and hide in the long grass like and produce something on that day, that particular day, that could surprise many. I wouldn't rule Derry out of winning that game whatsoever. And if that happens, and then say Armagh then face into a league campaign of Division 1, I... Uh, you know, it could go one or two ways. Like, they could end up like a killed there, losing all their games. And then you're wondering, well, where exactly was McGinney's legacy at the end of all this? It's a fair so, point. So, well, what I, what I was going to say... Mean, you're always on a knife edge as a manager. And we're talking worst-case scenarios here and, and all that. But um, but uh, Armagh are an interesting case study. Like, you know, they've got all the talent. They, they've got an enormous coaching staff, like, you know, Paddy McKeever, John Toll, Dennis Hollywood. They're all there, uh, along with Jim McCurry and Kieran McGinney and their s &C coach. You know, so um, there's a big effort being put into the, this group of players. Just even to look at um, the fact that Jim McCurry does so many of the post-match interviews, is that is that is that always the case? Because, you know, I mean... I, I would have probably covered a lot of Kildare games when, when Geezer was over the team then and he seemed to regularly talk. But now, like even watching the Sunday game on Sunday night, it was McCurry mm -hmm. put in front of the media. Is there any particular reason for that? I don't know. Um, other than he just, in my experience over the last number of years, he just doesn't do them. Unless they lose, 
uh, unless they lose like the loss against Calvin in the semi-final replay last year and he decided he would be the one that faced the media and I think he did it I think he did it after they lost to Mayo was it in the qualifiers round four uh, but he tends to send Jim out to do that and uh, Jim McCurry is very, he's very good at it you know he's, he's a very good talker very interesting fella in his own right um, and a basketball obsessive uh, got great success out of Kilku um, has been coaching for a long long time my god you think about like you know back in the early 90s him and John Morrison were the Armand managers he was a very young man then uh, but he must love it like you know because he's a Lurgan man like you know and he's been living most of his life now in Restrever and County Down but uh, you know it must be a real thrill for him to be involved in Arma at this stage of his life like you know um, and he would have so much to offer just um, let's talk about this Kilcommon video that appeared at the end of, of last week. When I initially saw it come up on my WhatsApp group, I think everyone in the country had it in their WhatsApp group, I was like, I couldn't even be bothered looking at it. Because you kind of have a feeling of what it's going to be like. I've done enough training sessions over the years. God knows it's probably thousands at this stage. And you're like, I, I know I'm not going to see anything particularly dif- uh, different. And I even left it until, I think, Sunday morning to even look at it. And as predicted, it was lads wrestling, trying to keep it, the other guy down on the ground, and some lad roaring, keep him down with C. Everyone knows that four letter word. At uh, first, and I was like, so what? Why are we even talking about this? Yeah, I don't know why the club themselves actually spoke about it. And that's the most embarrassing thing. Like, um, you know. It was an embarrassment <laughs> to snowflakes, I would say. Like, I'd say a snowflake would, would get a fit of the vapors, go, or what are they even getting ex- exercised about here? Yeah, the word, the weird thing for me was when I seen it, I watched it, and I thought, wow. And then I sent it on to somebody else who uh, I was helping out or assisting last year with a team and said, God, look, at the Kerry lads are doing what we were doing this time last year. They're only catching up with us. But I suppose if there was a difference, we were doing it on a fairly dry pitch. Uh, and the way I was running the drill was it was 30 seconds of wrestling and it was between pairs. One man was number one, the other was two, but there was a ball there too. So when you blew the whistle after 30 seconds, the man's job was to get the ball and put it over the bar. So it's like anything else in coaching. What is coaching for? You're meant to replicate match day scenarios. And when you're away at another club uh, in the far end of the county, there's no neutral umpires. Uh, a fullback can wrestle you. At, with impunity off the ball uh, before, a, before a delivery might be put in. So, I mean, this is exactly, all you're doing is hot housing players in that environment to say, this is what's going to happen in a game. You're going to be under pressure. You're going to expend a lot of energy being pulled and wrestled and all the rest. And then you're still going to have to get up, make a run, get the ball and shoot. You're going to have to shoot when you're fatigued. So... so I've done a couple of different versions of this over the years. My very, very first training session when I moved up to Kula was with these lads from the Defence Forces. So they were coming in to try and, you know, sort us out, us soft uh, city, Southside City boys and this blogger. And like within the first session, it was that kind of stuff uh, just to get to the root here, you know, try and see how how, uh, how much stomach you have. Like first training session, I remember um, they had those army stretchers, you know, to that if someone was hurt on the battlefield, you'd run around with them. I wasn't doing whatever the runs were properly. Um, I was probably not paying attention. And my first ever training session, I had some of the other lads that I was joining run around the field with me on a stretcher as they were absolutely bollocks already. They had to run me around the field. And that was only part of it. But then we came to the drill, which was the exact same as the one in that Kilcommon video. Yeah, so yeah. I think the actual defense forces guy had to do with me because we had an odd number and I didn't know anyone, you know, you're, you're kind of left on your own. And we were doing it and like, it was fine. Like everyone's roaring at each other. Everyone, uh-huh. nobody's listening to see is there a four letter word going on. Like it's no problem. And like, uh-huh. so when I saw it, I was like, I think you, 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 have you go to any football or hurling intercounty club, whatever. Sometimes club can be an awful lot worse. You go to any game. And you sit in the stand and you listen to what people are saying. It's, I don't see the. I don't know why it was brought up or, or, or became a thing. You know. Um, um, I just think this comes up if you're not familiar with what it's like to be in a GA environment. You would think this thing is unusual. Yeah, yeah. Like even if you jump to modern day training, like in hurling especially, and there's probably versions of it in Gaelic football. You'll start off with two lads fighting over a ball. 
So you'll yeah, both yeah. be trying to push each other off the ball, and then the whistle will blow after 30 seconds, you'll get the ball and someone try to fire it, fire it over. It's the same thing. Like I mean, it's just a different version of the same thing. And industrial language is used in GA, and people can snowflake away and say, oh, that shouldn't be the way, and people's feelings and all that. And fine, I get that. But nobody's actually going to do like absolutely destroy somebody and, and break their spirit on a GA field. Obviously, people cross the line now and again, and that's to be admonished. But stuff like this, come on, like, get over it. Yeah, I mean, it's as much as anything else, it's a, it's a mental thing. Like, how, how can you deal with somebody who's laying on top of you, putting you on the ground, knowing that that whistle is going to blow and you're, you're going to get a chance to either kick a score and get back at him or prevent him from getting a score? And that's like, you know, you win your wee moral victories, you win your wee victories against your direct opponent. I mean, this is just all part of the psychology of it, all the mentality, a team spirit building. Like, and then you call them all into a into a huddle and the steam is rising off them. It's like looking at a field of cattle or something like in the morning. It's absolutely, I, you know, I, I have to say it was one of the favorite things that I would have done with them because of the response and the endorphins flowing and the testosterone. And that's the sort of thing that we actually did video ourselves doing it. And the purpose we used it for was because we showed the players in at the height of the summer. And we said, look, you know, look at all the, Look at all the hardship that we endured over the year to get in the shape that we're in, and now you're well prepared. You know, it's just to convince them. So, if if anything, that's almost like a well-tested formula of GA teams, and I, like I've seen it at clubs up and down the country. You just video the stu- when you're at your doing the hardest possible stuff, then put together a little video of it later on to sort of say, lads, this is the journey we've been on. It's like standard practice. It is all a matter, isn't it? Let's jump on to Darren Gleeson. He's, he's in his first year as sole manager of Antrim. And you did a piece with the 42 last week, just kind of charting the rise of Antrim in the last couple of years. If you can call it that, I suppose it's, it's kind of steps by degree. And like 2016, Sambo and Dominic uh, McKinley took over because, mm-hmm. you know, th- at that stage, there, was, there had been an issue with getting players to even commit to the county team. I mean, everyone has the sort of rose tinted glasses of what Antrim Hurling is and, you know, getting beaten awfully to get to the All Ireland final in 1989. There's that element of it, but then there's the the fact that the results haven't really stacked up over the years. Yes, there was the 2010 shock against Dublin, but other than that, there hasn't really been, for a county that's so insane about its hurling, they probably haven't really delivered on it. Yeah, but I mean, it's like what Michael Ryan said in that piece, like, you know, when he had been at a, a seminar, a coaching seminar among Kerry clubs, there's a passion for hurling and then there's a passion for club hurling. And that's certainly the way it is. It was for a long time in Antrim. Denny Cahill, anyone who ever played under Denny Cahill has got an awful lot of good to say about him. Like, you know, that he, they lost narrowly to Tip, wasn't it, in, in 02, lost narrowly to Wexford in all Ireland semi or quarter final in 03. Uh, fair enough, like what he said about Brian Corcoran and that came back to haunt him. Cork stuffed them that time. But, like, you know, only in 2010, like, only for a wee bit of gamesmanship from Cork backline, they got Liam Watson sent off. Uh, that was heading for a tight game, too. After that, a uh, bit of a dip. Kevin Ryan had it, as I said in the piece, like, he asked 54 lads in or something, and he got 17 lads that would come in. And he says, of that 17, he ended up with just, like, a dozen in his championship squad, which are phenomenal numbers like you know Kevin Ryan had been involved in Waterford inter-county teams like you know he was a uh, and he was in it for all the right reasons like he was extremely passionate even now you see him tweeting about the potential of Antrim like you know he's a he's a proper hurling man he actually went on to coach Tyrone when he left Antrim but he finished up uh, he finished up and then let get the order of this right uh, he finished up and P. Joe Mullen Jr. took over. He was the manager of Loch Gale when they won the 2012 All Ireland Club. And again, he had the same, he had similar problems getting boys to commit. And just things did not go well at all. I think they were in Division 2A again. I think they were in Division 2A and they didn't get up. But the, that, that came as such a shock to them at that point that, like, you know, things didn't go well and P. Joe stepped off that. Um, 
there was some kind of a charade over Jerry Wallace too for a time. I think it may have been around about those years. I forget now. Well, that would have been some commute for him from Cork all the way up to Antrim. Uh, I, um, he turned up then. I mean, it was given to Jim Nelson. This back probably before Kevin Ryan's time, actually. It was given to Jim Nelson. He was the manager in 89. Uh, and then Wallace just turned up after having dropped off the initial management team. I think he was in with Denny, actually, and Bobby Thornhill of Cork and Jerry Wallace. That was it. Uh, but jumping forward, Antrim turned to Sambo and Woody, two heroes from 89, like, you know, and very respected. I think this is their third time in charge of Antrim seniors, uh, and they would never say no to their county. Like, they're, they're remarkable pair of fellas, and they put together a bit of a management team with Neil Peden, uh, which would incorporate the city. So you had sort of Waddy, who was initially a, a Lock Gielman, won the All Ireland Club with them in '83. Samuel from Cushendall, Gary O'Kane, who was a 19 year old in 1989, bringing in Don Loy. So these are three big uh, team. People say it's the Glens. It's, technically, it's not the Glens, but it's the three leading clubs. Then you had Neil Peden, recognises you know one of the, bring in the city guys. Uh, but then even they were they're finding it tough at the start. You know, you're you're brought in midway through a season. So they had their first full season in twenty seventeen, halfway through that they recognised, no, we're we're actually gonna have to do something here to attract boys. And that's when they got Liam Sheedy in for uh twenty eighteen. But Sheedy, the thing I like most about him was he wasn't he was there helping them now. He wasn't in the nuts and bolts of every train session or anything. But Cheney went along to an awful lot of stuff in Antrim and he, he looked at it with a cold eye. He would have looked over their Celtic Challenge teams and stuff like that and examined how things were done and offering advice behind the scenes. All of this was sort of coinciding with the, the establishment of the Saffron Business Forum. Uh, people like Tony Shivers are from Premier Electric, like, you know, highly successful businessmen uh, who wanted to raise the profile and morale and all of that of Antrim. So when Sheedy was there, Sheedy brought along Darren Gleeson then, and he would be helping out a wee bit as goalkeeping coach. And then uh, Sambo and Woody stepped away for last year. Neil kept it going. Neil Payden and Gary O'Kane kept it going. They had then Darren was the, the coach. Darren was also a double job, and then with Tip as a goalkeeping coach. And at the end of the year, then they said to give it to Darren. I mean, it was sort of a logical progression you can see Neil Peden then was appointed as director of Hurling um, which is an entirely new role all of this comes in the context of Gaelfast, new investment in Belfast area um, it's, it is a series of positives that have to be weighed all up against the fact that they don't have an actual ground of casement like you know that's a huge black spot for them but the people who are there are so well meaning and the potential there is boundless. I mean, at times, it just feels like, you know, two steps forward and three back. Um, and it might have been that way if they didn't get the two late goals against Offaly. The adrenaline shot that would have given off Antrim Hurling this weekend can't be underestimated. They're playing Kerry now. Uh, I don't know, I think four Kerry players missed out on the last game they played, and they won down there. Um, yeah, Kerry had some players missing with mumps, and among those was Shane Conway, who was, probably, who was definitely good enough to be playing at Liam McCarthy level. But anyway, just yeah, to yeah. jump on, I mean, so you have the Division 2A final, which means you can get promotion there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Leinster is going to go to six teams, so there's an opportunity there to get up to Liam McCarthy level and, you know, have a, a good chance at staying there if they're to win the Joe McDonough Cup and even get an All Ireland preliminary quarter final at a minimum this year. So, I mean, there is all that. Darren Gleeson, though, I mean, I remember, like, he's sort of larger than life character, big man, all that kind of stuff, sort of a very familiar exterior or a friendly exterior to him. I did an article with him in 2015, and it was just about how he looked at puck outs and, and you know, tactics, I suppose, in a general sense. And I just read out the quote, and he goes, I read an article about that in football last week where Dublin attacks start with uh, Cluxton setting up 70% scoring with successful kickouts. Doesn't come right. across into hurling. I put more emphasis on breaking ball, guys winning breaks more than puckouts. There's a lot more breaking balls in a match than puckouts. You might have 80 or 90 breaking balls, you might have 50 puckouts. So there's more of an emphasis on that. It's just a trend when you have a sweeper, then you have more route to hit short ball and people are more conscious of successful percentages. So I'd analyse the success rate in a different area more than puckouts. So it's very obvious he's a guy who thinks about his hurling and, and the knock-on effect of different aspects of it. 
that's amazing. That's that's very interesting. Now, winning the rock now is um, such a huge thing, Gaelic sport. I mean, Armagh completely dominated from on in football on Saturday night in that respect too. If they weren't winning a clean, they were still committing more bodies or more people were willing to zip across the lines and get that ball. Like but, in, but, in Hurland, that is probably... You would probably narrow it down to three or four KPIs, key performance indi- uh, indicators in a match. Yeah, yeah. Breaking ball would, I would say, every team around the country, that is one of the key ones. Yeah, and but I suppose, you know, Darren has put together his management team, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, he's had a... Um, the S and C guy's name, I think he's Ronan Murphy. His name escapes me now. I think he was with Down before. You know, like you recognised guy in Gale Games doing this. He's got a nutritionist in Julia Bone, uh, who's looking after all that. There, you know, the passions, the passions there, right? You go up to an entrepreneurial fair. It's one of my favourite days of the year covering any sports. The, it, the crowds they get, the colour of it. The rivalry, like I mean, Jesus, like Dunnoy were playing Cushion Doll um, in the Antrim Horn final in Ballycastle this year, and at half time, Cushion Doll players were coming in, and all the Dunnoy kids. There was a tunnel that was in Ballycastle for them to walk into the dressing rooms, and all the um, Cushion Doll players came in. But there was these hordes, like of dozens of kids, that all just converged along the sides of it, and they all booed the Cushion Doll players coming in. And what I saw was. There was actually a presentation for the uh, 89 team and Gary O'Kane, obviously we've been talking about the selector, he's a Dunloy man, and he ran over to that and started roaring at the kids, get away, and I stopped that. And the kids, once they saw him, they just completely scattered. Uh, TG Cahar were up there that day and it was such a great advertisement that, uh, you know, this is how good Antrim Hurling can be when you've got all these players playing for them. And it, there was, some of them would be less heralded because they mightn't have come out for the county. But... Most of what they have now are all out. And what they need after that is, yes, you can have all the good structures, good people in there, good S&C, good nutritionists, all that. But what stood out for me, uh, and Antrim have had straight talkers, like no one's a, a more straight talker than Sambo. Um, but uh, Michael Ryan said in that piece that when Darren Gleeson's talking to you, it's such a, 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 for him, it reminds him so much of Liam Shady. And obviously they're Port Room man. But he says he is nailing you with every sentence, like, you know, and he's just driving every sentence home that you cannot fail but learn. And, I mean, that's so important, you know, the strength of personality, as you say, larger in life. So it's definitely looking positive. You know, you know they, they, could, they could lose this weekend. We could be having a completely different conversation. But, like, you can't be guilty of just looking at one result and basing your whole uh, outlook on it. The, you know, Darren Gleeson is not, as Ryan says, wanting to be up there for one year, be celebrity banister, parachute it in, enjoy the experience, and then go away home and do something else or take a club and tip. Like, this is a longer term. Okay, well, people can read that piece on the 42.e. Um, I've probably taken up enough of your time, Declan, so I appreciate you joining me. We'll do it again soon. No problem, Shane. Pleasure. Thank you.